So welcome everybody and uh, welcome to the second event in the uh, second annual EDID week. And that week is put on by the Office of the Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And so I'm Kay Johnson, the Executive Director of Human Rights, Equity and Accessibility at the University. And I will be your host uh, for the evening. So just really doing a beginning piece in that. And then I'll be turning things over to the moderator. And uh, so in the meantime, uh, I would like to say that the uh, Office of the VP EDI welcomes you and that we're here to continue some of this uplifting of work, as well as the challenges having to do with the challenge of, of uh, oppression and the work of anti-oppression, and as well acknowledging the ongoing work that's required to build a campus and community and our world. So recognizing that these things are not things that are one and done or even 100 and done, but as part of that lifelong commitment. We all talk about lifelong learning. So this is a piece of that and recognizing that it's always changing. Um, I'd also like to say that, uh, of course, beginning today, that uh, EDID week is running all week long. And so there are a variety of events. So I encourage you to uh, go into the website and see other events that will be taking place all week long. Um, in terms of tomorrow, Tuesday's event, we have a few things on the go. Uh, one is from 11.30 till noon. That's part of the Accessibility Awareness Days. And this is in collaboration with OREA. And that's a virtual event. And these are the, the ones that are happening every Tuesday throughout the Mar week of March. And tomorrow's one is uh, on quick tips for making your bright space site more accessible and that's hosted by Mark Lubrick and Lori Stalchuk of the Office of Open Learning. And then at 1 till 2.30 there's a virtual panel discussion on celebrating Asian heritage for an equitable diverse inclusive learning community. So the panelists include uh, Dr. Edward Venzon, Venzon Cruz, Dr. Cruz, uh, Dr. Jane Ku. Uh, Dr. Grace Louis, uh, Dr. Navad Baki, oh sorry, Bakali, and uh, Dr. Shi Zhu, and Dr. Chenka Chi, sorry. And then on at 6 p.m. till 7:30 that night, tomorrow night, there's a lecture by Dr. Natalie Dahlia Deckard on eliminating. Sorry, I'm really having trouble seeing my little screen here on eliminating racial discrimination in public institutions in higher education. Uh, Dr. Deckard is an associate professor of criminology and the founding director of the Black Studies Institute at the University of Windsor. And so that event will be held in person at the School of Creative Arts Armories Performance Hall, uh, as well as there's an option to stream online. And so to register for any of those, you can go to the uinsert.ca slash VPEDE, oh, sorry, VPEDI. So uh, I'd like to start with the uh, a land, with a land acknowledgement, which is recognizing that the University of Windsor is on the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy. That's the Ojibwe, the Adawa and the Potawatomi. And that we also want to acknowledge, when we do the um, traditional land acknowledgement, it's uh, very important that we recognize the people. So we're not just recognizing the land because uh, you cannot separate the people from the land. And also that it's important that when we think about land acknowledgements, that we don't just stop there, that we think about the various aspects throughout, even as we um, operate in our day-to-day -day lives and such on the land, that we don't lose sight of whose land this is and also the connection that we have and such. So uh, a quick thing about the uh, event details. 
So this is on anti-Semitism, reflections on how to name, frame, and challenge. So the, um, what we have here today is there's a Q&A section. So the mics are off and the cameras are off, but uh, there's the Q&A section that's there that you can go and leave any uh, questions for the Q&A portion because there'll be the uh, discussion pieces first and then there'll be about 30 minutes at the end for Q&A and those get submitted and then uh, they'll be posted or such uh, on the uh, by Kayla and Kate in the background such as there is time we'll be able to go through that. If you're looking for a, an accessibility feature, the three dots, if you're on IBM type thing, the three dots at the top where it says more, if you click on that and then you go uh, down to where it's about the language piece in that, you click on there and then you can do the, uh, the live captioning. It's actually pretty good. Um, it's pretty good for following along at a good pace and such. Um, also, uh, I'd like to uh, say, just let me, sorry, take a brief second to uh, make sure that, uh, yeah, we talked about the Q&A and such. And so actually at this point in time, I will turn it over to the moderator. Uh, that would be uh, Jillian Rogan, who will be able to uh, introduce all of our speakers. Thanks so much, Kay. Um, I'll start by by thanking Dr. Beckford's office uh, for inviting us here, including us in this really important conversation, including uh, Kate Hargraves and Kayla Hurst. And uh, thank you so much for all of your work organizing this really important event, but also this entire week. It's such an exciting um, lineup of uh, rich speakers. And I, I, I know that there's going to be so many conversations opened as a result of this week. Um, I'll start by acknowledging that I'm calling from Hamilton, Ontario, which is situated on the traditional territories of the Erie um, Neutral here on Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and, and Mississauga people. This land is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Bail uh, Belt Covenant, Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people to share and care for the resources around the lakes. And when we say the words of land acknowledgement, I hope that we're not ever merely uttering words. We're um, giving ourselves a call to action and we're proclaiming our responsibilities. Um, we commit to dismantling settler colonization and all of its manifestations. And we commit to understanding that slavery in Canada um, was and is intertwined with settler colonization and is left behind the legacy of anti-Black racism. We commit to understanding all forms of uh, oppression, including racism, sexism, trans and homophobia, xenophobia, ableism and classism as connected to dismantling settler colonization. And we recognize that settler colonization projects on a, on a global scale need to be dismantled. So my name is Jillian Rogan and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Windsor in the Faculty of Law and I'm also a criminal defense lawyer. Um, I'm joined today, uh, I'm really honored to be joined today by my colleagues, uh, Professor Abigail Backen and retired Professor Cheryl Mestel. We are all, the three of us, members of the Jewish Faculty Network, the JFN. The JFN coalesced around a statement rejecting what is called uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism or IRA as it's commonly referred to. And I think during our talk, we'll, we'll get into IRA maybe a little bit more. Um, as an anti-racist identified group, the JFN is deeply concerned about fighting anti-Semitism and all, of, all forms of racism, but we reject the ways that the uh, the ways in which IRA works to stifle legitimate criticism of the state of Israel and its policies towards Palestinian people. So today our panel will be discussing what anti-Semitism is, um, how we think that we ought to work to oppose, condemn and eradicate it. We intend for this conversation to be an opening uh, of dialogue and not a mechanism to close conversations. And we want to recognize, of course, at the outset, um, that what we're talking about, anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, including anti-Palestinian racism, are exceptionally violent, of course, um, which, which means that these are difficult and uh, emotive and challenging conversations to have, but we need to have them. 
And we need to conduct these discussions recognizing the real, real experiences of racism and anti-Semitism that many people experience. Our intention is that our panel discussion today might assist all of us to identify anti-Semitism and to think through what mechanisms we need to combat it. So we're going to start with Professor Abigail Bakken, um, who will be discussing what anti-Semitism is and what it's not. Um, Cheryl will then speak about what we mean when we speak of the Jewish community and sort of problematizing that idea and some of the issues that unite and divide us. And lastly, I'll be speaking about the implications of relying on criminal law to fight anti-Semitism. Our bios are posted on the EDID website, and I thought we wouldn't take up time um, going through them again. But I will say that each of us, I think, is going to share some biographical information um, as we go. And at the outset, I want to recognize that the three of us uh, identify as Ashkenazi Jewish women who hold and carry white privilege. Um, there are many Jews who are not white, including Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews, Black and Brown Jews, Southeast Asian Jews. Jewish people have a rich, hugely diverse um, number of backgrounds and ethnic identities. I can't, it's not possible for me to list them. Uh, we don't speak here today for all Jews, um, and we don't speak on behalf of any notion of the Jewish community, which, you know, I, again, I think we're going to problemize today. Um, our comments should really be understood through the lenses of identities and privileges that we hold. So each of us will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll ask participants to post questions in the Q&A and, and we'll be, um, with the help of uh, Kay collecting the, and Kayla, I think, helping to collect the, the questions and we'll, you know, we'll, do, we'll respond amongst the three of us. So if I can turn it over to Abby. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, can everybody hear me? We're good. OK. So yeah, thank you to my uh, fellow sister panelists and um, to the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Office of the University of Windsor. It's really a, a privilege to be here. And thank you all of you who are sharing your evening with us um, in this important conversation. So let me start by just talking about the, the, the language and limitations of anti-Semitism. The word anti-Semitism is like many terms imperfect. It has multiple meanings in various contexts. The term itself actually originated in unfavorable circumstances. It was introduced uh, in Germany in the late 1800s as a scientific sounding word for um, Judenhass or Jew hatred, and it was introduced by someone who was an advocate of anti-Semitism, not of someone who was opposed to it. But language changes over time, and in contemporary usage, I would suggest that it has three meanings. One is anti-Semitism as anti-Judaism, which refers to prejudice against the Jewish religion, and from which one can convert into or out of. And this is a very long-standing legacy which predates modernity. Another very recent term is often referred to as the new anti-Semitism. And this is a politically constructed claim that criticism of the state of Israel is the same as anti-Semitism and that criticism on this grounds needs to be opposed as if it is, we are opposing um, anti-Semitism and silenced. I think this is not an accurate meaning of the term, um, but it is very widespread. Uh, it has um, political forces behind it, including those that are closely associated with the interests of the state of Israel. And then anti-Semitism as anti-Jewish racism, which is like any form of racism grounded in ascribed phenotypes and stereotypes. It's extraordinarily divisive. It can be very violent. Um, and this is a associated with the concept of something called Jewish blood, um, which doesn't exist, but it is claimed to exist, which means you're born into it. And no matter what your ideas are over the course of or beliefs, um, you are still treated as someone who is a threat. And I want to be um, focusing on, on the latter two meetings in my comments today. So let me start with anti-Semitism as anti-Jewish racism. The, the Holocaust, the politically sanctioned genocide against Jews as a race, uh, in quotations, this was grounded on this conception of Jewish blood that characterized the politics and state 
of Germany under Adolf Hitler from the period of 1933 to 1945 and the related occupied and ceded territories such as Visby France. This is the example, of course, of the most extreme anti-Semitism um, as anti-Jewish racism that we commonly uh, are familiar with, painfully familiar. And I, I have to extend a in addition to, to Jill's warning, a, a trigger warning for those who find this difficult and, and might need to take care of yourselves during this discussion. This is a crucial period of history for us to know and understand, and I can't do justice to it in a brief, brief um, time. But I want to just mention two things. First of all, most families internationally in uh, contemporary life and certainly in Canada and the United States have been directly affected by the violence of the Holocaust. Most of us have either lost family members or we have family members who barely survived or escaped or went into hiding and this has left a deep legacy of pain and intergenerational trauma. The sense of a need to claim a place of safe haven is often emotional and not necessarily easily addressed with rational discourse um, even if the rational discourse is actually necessary for moving forward and thinking about healing. The second point I want to make is that even though um, there were you know, many states that opposed the, the Nazi states, the allied states were not um, in any way necessarily and not certainly not uniformly opposed to the Nazis because of their anti-Semitism. In fact, act, an, active anti-Semitism was being profligated during this time, and it was commonplace internationally. For an example, in um, Evian, France in 1938, an international conference took place to consider the crisis of Jewish refugees fleeing Germany related and related areas of uh, that were under Nazism. And every single one of those states, with the exception of two tiny states, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, refused to accept any Jewish refugees. In Canada, then Prime Minister uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King stated that the admission, this is a quote, the admission of refugees perhaps posed a greater menace to Canada in 1938 than Hitler. And this position was consistent with the advice of the director of immigration at the time, Charles Frederick Blair, who now famously stated that in terms of the number of acceptable Jewish refugees, the answer was none is too many. So anti-Semitism was not only a feature of border control, but characteristics of civil society and daily public life, both in English Canada and in Quebec, where signs commonly read no Jews or dogs allowed. In Canada and the US, there were quotas, some explicit, some implicit, on many professions, also on Jewish students that were admitted to universities. And today, anti-Semitism is no longer considered in the same way. It is no longer considered an acceptable element of modern liberal democratic politics. But there are many indications that what was once understood to be a fringe notion um, a, of extreme overt active anti-Semitism is now actually fighting its way back from the margins and into greater legitimacy, especially among certain mainstream conservative um, politics and right-wing nationalist um, organizations. So I'll just give you a few recent examples. These will be familiar to people who pay attention to the news. On August, um, in August 2017, there was a march of about 100. It wasn't large, but it was very violent in Charlottesville, Virginia in the US, bearing in one hand torched lights and on the other hand, Nazi salutes. And the signs included swastikas, the symbol of the German Nazi regime, and the crowd shouted various slogans in practiced unison, including Jews will not replace us. In 2018, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, during a, you know, a regular sort of moment of, of religious prayer, um, was the victim of an armed man who shot and killed 11 and injured six in an overtly anti-Semitic attack. And in January, 20, January 6, 2021, a mob of what we could really only call domestic terrorists attacked the US Capitol, some wearing t-shirts that said Camp Auschwitz on them, and many who were associated with far-right white nationalist organizations. But this is not just an American trend. In Ottawa, in January and February of 2022, 
Ostensibly about vaccine mandates, there was a protest that saw flags with Nazi swastikas as well as U.S. Confederate flags and anti-Semitic um, statements and leaflets were being distributed. So, you know, this is overt anti-Semitism. There are also many common stereotypes about Jewish people that we commonly don't discuss that linger in our society, many predating Nazism by many centuries. These include myths about the Jewish body, Jewish noses, Jewish motherhood, uh, myths about stinginess with money, full-blown conspiracy theories uh, rooted in claims like the falsified documents of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Many of these have not been challenged in common sense. So, all of this addresses what anti-Semitism is, but we have a problem because often this language of anti-Semitism doesn't focus on these issues. And there are other issues that are considered to be anti-Semitic. The state of Israel maintains that it is a remedy for this type of anti-Semitism, that it is a safe haven as a Jewish state. I am a professor um, in the Faculty of Education at the University of Toronto, but I'm also a political scientist. And in political science, we look at states. It should be obvious that if we look at the state of Israel, it should follow the same rules as other states subject to international law, subject to egalitarian principles that are commonly accepted. But the state of Israel has a situation where all of the major political parties adhere to a common political ide ideology, which is sometimes called Zionism. This is a specific view that claims to represent the interests of all Jewish people. But Zionism is not the same as Jewish theology or Jewish identity. It's a political ism like anarchism or socialism that advocates for a nation state solution to anti-Semitism. And it has historically been contested. It continues to be contested. And this panel indicates that to some extent today. Israel both claims to be a liberal democratic state, which should be subject to international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as opposed as a, approved by the United Nations, the UN General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, and so on and so forth. But it also, in claiming to be a quote unquote Jewish state or a religious state, bases itself on a fundamentalist reading of ancient biblical text. So repeated governments in Israel, including its own institutions and laws, and again, all the major political parties, insist that Israel should not function in the same way similar to other states. And that gets us into a lot of trouble. For those of us who, who are Jewish, who claim our Jewish identity, are proud of our Jewish identity. It is very uncomfortable when there is a state that claims to represent you where you really don't have any input into that. And I'll put myself in that situation. Um, I was, you know, raised in Jewish Sunday school. I was bat mitzvahed. And there was a common expression that we would hear that Israel was a land without a people for a people without a land. But that is not true. The area of Palestine where Israel is settled was never empty, and it is not its only empty land in myth and story. It's been constructed politically, ideologically, and emotionally as terra nullius, the Latin phrase that was used by European colonial powers to mean that land that is legally deemed to be unoccupied or uninhibited is available for foreign settlement. And as the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association tells us, Palestinians and Palestine are actually subject to a unique form of racism, anti-Palestinian racism, which includes denial of the reality of this history. So as long as there is occupation and displacement for Palestinians and their histories are denied and, and silenced, there is contestation, there is resistance, and it's important for us to know this in order to be able to think about solidarity. So I'll conclude by just sharing a little bit about my own positionality. Um, I too, like all of us speaking here, I'm no stranger to anti-Semitism. My late parent, parents were born and raised in New York City. They were the children of Polish and Russian refugees to America who fled violent anti-Semitic pogroms or massacres in their home countries. All of our relatives who were unable to leave Eastern Europe remain unaccounted for, presumed to have died in the Holocaust. My parents hoped that their children would grow up in a world where we could avoid the daily experiences of anti-Semitism that they experienced. So they did certain things to try to hide our Jewish identity in the public world. My parents married as Bakanovskis. They shortened their name to Bakan in hopes that we would quote unquote pass. 
um, and our Jewish names were anglicized. My own namesake, my Aunt Basha, is only known to me as someone who died in Hitler's gas chambers. My parents spoke Yiddish as a secret form of communication with each other, ostensibly to keep their six children from understanding their private conversations. But in reality, our inability to speak Yiddish, in our, which was actually my parents' mother tongue, also meant that we were much less vulnerable to being marked as Jewish when we walked outside the house if we had a slip in conversation. So we grew up white and I live white and we have a lot of privilege because of that, but I call it a whiteness by permission um, because it comes with certain strings attached and permission can be granted and permission can be re refused or reneged. I'm also a dual citizen of Canada and the United States with many family members that live very near where the Tree of Life synagogue was and is. So coming to terms with what anti-Semitism is also means coming to terms with what anti-Semitism is not. In order to be able to organize and fight against anti-Jewish racism, we need to stand in solidarity with all those who are victims of all kinds of racism and know that if we link arms and we insist on not being divided in order to be conquered, that we'll be stronger for it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Abby. I've just taken like a page of notes. Um, your your comments have are so thoughtful and have helped me inspired a lot of questions. Maybe we'll get to some um, in the past in the in the question period. So thank you very much. And Cheryl, if you want to take the floor. Okay. Can you hear me? Jill, is it? You can hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Uh, it, it really is great to be here for this EDID uh, week at Windsor, and and we really are very grateful for the opportunity to um, to share our thoughts with you. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and uh, start with a bit of a story. So recently, I was invited by a, a well-known financial institution to give a talk on anti-Semitism in honor of uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. So their only request was that I not bring the topic of Israel into the presentation. Um, I politely declined the invitation and said it wasn't possible to discuss anti-Semitism in the current moment without bringing Israel and Zionism into the conversation. Um, so in the time that I'm allotted here, I, I will bring Israel into the conversation as Abby did in an attempt to explain the forces that currently shape and in many ways distort our understanding of anti-Semitism impeding our ability to fight the indisputable rise in anti-Jewish hate, as well as our ability to make that fight part of a wider struggle against racism and colonialism. So the question at the center of this debate is whether strong criticism of Israel and advocacy of equal rights for all those living in Israel-Palestine constitute anti-Semitism. So those that believe that a state of Jews and for Jews, which is a, a phrase that was just used in a, in a letter to the Jewish community by uh, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. Um, and this is the foundation of political Zionism, that um, this is an inherently undemocratic and illiberal formation. Um, and, uh, you know, we are accused of, uh, those who believe that are accused of denying Jews, who don't believe in that, uh, are accused of denying Jews the same rights according to other national groups. So this is the basis, and again, Abby mentioned it, of a new what's called the new anti-Semitism. It's a term that dates to from the early 1970s. Um, and basically that, that understanding of anti-Semitism sees Jews as, uh, sees Israel as the Jew among nations, uh, in the word of Canva's anti-Semitism czar, uh, Erwin Kotler. So basically this is an equation, equating of anti-Zionism or the opposition to Zionism, political opposition, um, to anti-Semitism itself. Um, an argument that means that individuals or institutions can be deemed anti-Semitic for holding opinions that can range from criticism of the policies of the Israeli government to denying that Israel has the right to exist as an exclusively Jewish state without referring any of those beliefs that have been traditionally regarded as constituting anti-Semitic worldview. This is a departure, this is a historic departure. Um, but a state cannot be exempt from criticism simply because it is Jewish. 
Uh, impunity is a recipe for violence and authoritarianism, and this is precisely what we are seeing at this very moment um, and what we've seen for decades. And it's interesting, if, you, if you've been watching the news, there are literally, um, you know, half a million uh, Israeli, mostly Jews, there are some others uh, in the country who are joining in, um, who have been uh, marching in the streets against the judicial reforms that are going to uh, essentially um, in, in impede democracy in the country. So what the concept, this concept of a new anti-Semitism has enabled us uh, see is the use of, as, as enabled this concept, is the use of allegations of anti-Semitism as a weapon to silence criticism of Israel and discredit and impede the struggle for Palestinian human rights. So accusations of anti-Semitism always, always carry with them associations with the Holocaust and the Nazis' genocidal extermination of most of Europeans, of Europe's Jews and of Jewish culture in Europe. So this form of definition, defamation has been referred to as the nuclear option of political rhetoric, uh, a sort of magic wand that automatically renders someone outside the realm of modern Western principles of tolerance and civility. There, there can be no, you know, lower, uh, you know, epithet thrown at someone as being an anti-Semite. Um, it is a powerful rhetoric that renders the accused morally compromised when used in reference to Israel and Palestine, and fits neatly into our post 9-11 world of deep Islamophobia, anti-Arabism, and anti-Palestinian racism. So definitions have been at the forefront of the internal tensions of, among Jews about how best to oppose anti-Semitism. And, and this is one of the things I really want to um, make uh, central to my talk today, is that there is no one Jewish community, there is no one uh, perspective on anti-Semitism as much as you may be told that certain groups represent, you know, the most accepted definition. This is patently untrue. Um, in fact, there's probably never been a greater confusion about what anti-Semitism is, who is anti-Semitic, where anti-Semitism is coming from, how it manifests, uh, and what is to be done to prevent it. So as Professor David Feldman, director of the Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Antisemitism at London University has said, and I find this very moving because it's very, uh, you know, self-deprecating in some ways. Uh, Feldman says, when it comes to antisemitism, many of us literally don't know what we're talking about and are happy to admit it. And as for the rest of us who think we do know what antisemitism is, we are congenitally unable to agree amongst ourselves. And that pretty much describes what's going on today in, inside the Jewish community worldwide. So I'm gonna stop here uh, and tell you something about myself. So I'm not a, a disinterested outsider to this debate. Um, unfortunately, Jews who share my beliefs are sometimes labeled with epithets such as kapo, uh, which, which has been assigned to Jews who assisted the Nazis during the Holocaust, or un-Jews who are seen to be disingenuously, who are seen to disingenuously leverage Jewish identity in order to criticize. So being Jewish of my life, 48 years ago, I married into a Holocaust survivor family. And my late mother-in-law's painting of her neighbors being shot and thrown into a deep pit hangs in my office. Um, in 1973, I moved to Israel where I lived for the next 15 years. I am an Israeli citizen. I speak fluent Hebrew. Um, my three children were born there, and my husband served in the army as a medic. Um, we left Israel in 1988 because we believed that Israeli Jews would willingly continue to be the masters of millions of Palestinians. Um, I do sell, I continue to celebrate Jewish holidays for Shabbat every week and have belonged to a synagogue for 35 years. Um, but despite all of this, my disloyalty to Zionism and criticism of the state have made me a pariah in my own community and the target of harassment. Um, I want to turn here now to how allegations of anti-Semitism are being deployed by many uh, of our Jewish communal institutions. Um, community, admittedly, is a very tricky term. Um, all of us belong to multiple imagined communities of one form or another, be they religious, geographic, ethnic, political, but all communities draw boundaries to exclude those who jeopardize the perceived homogeneity of the group. And of course, the Jewish community in Canada is no exception to this. 
Um, Jewish communal life here is dominated by organizations which claim to speak for all, all Jews, uh, despite any semblance of a communal democratic process in determining their policies or actions. Indeed, while in the past, Jewish organizations benefited from the Council of Scholars, Rabbis, other learned members of the community, etc., they are now dominated by a donor class. Um, there are now ideological checkpoints which determine who is and who is not a legitimate Jew. Um, all three of us in this call have been subjected to some of those criticisms. Um, there are several polls that demonstrate, uh, opinion polls, that diversity of opinion among Canadian Jews when it comes to Israel uh, definitely exists. And a poll just published just last week um, by two liberal Zionist organizations, JSpace and the New Israel Fund, reported that 59% of Canadian Jews believe that Israel is going in the wrong direction. 58% want the Canadian government to refuse to meet with racist extremists from the new Israeli government. And half of those who had an opinion about the matter felt that legacy, in other words, the institutional organizations uh, in Jewish life did not represent them when it came to criticizing Israel. And that's extremely significant. Um, interestingly, in Saturday's Glow and Mail, some of you may have seen, uh, a, a scathing op-ed decrying, and this is the title of it, The Unspeakable Silence of the Canadian Jewish Establishment um, about judicial reforms that threaten civil rights and basic democracy in the Jewish state. This is a pretty unprecedented uh, piece of writing. I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, these legacy Jewish organizations have extensive connections to Israeli institutions, and their campaigns are deeply influenced by Israeli strategies countering pro-Palestine discourse and activism. Among them, an aggressive push for governments, schools, and civil society organizations to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism, a document that has been rejected by hundreds of Jewish scholars, dozens of Jewish organizations, as a threat to freedom of speech and academic freedom, and as antithetical to free and open debate about Israel and Palestinian human rights. Even the editorial boards, and I have a long list of groups that have uh, condemned the IHRA, but even the editorial boards of the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post have all criticized the adoption of the definition. So what these legacy Jewish organizations refuse to acknowledge is that increasingly vocal, the, there is an increasingly vocal presence of groups of dissident Jews a phenomenon that has grown exponentially in the last decade. Jewish Voice for Peace in the US, which has taken an explicitly anti-Zionist stance, has a multi-million dollar budget and dozens of employees. The youth-oriented group, if not now, has recently denounced Israeli apartheid and continues to move leftward. The International Collect Jewish Collective for Justice in Palestine represents 17 Jewish groups in 14 countries around the globe. And my own organization, Independent Jewish Voices, has 18 member groups and is recognized as one of the world's most effective Palestine solidarity groups. To be sure, there are signs within many sectors of the Jewish community that cracks are visible in the wall of compulsory Israel loyalty. Um, I want to turn now to another complication in our attempts to comprehend and effectively fight anti-Semitism, and that is the collection of statistics on anti-Semitism in Canada. So several pro-Israel organizations worldwide collect and disseminate reports accounting for anti-Semitic incidents and levels of anti-Semitism. And there exists a growing ideological divide within the international Jewish community over how accurately these reports identify the sources of contemporary anti-Semitism and consequential, consequentially, whether claims of burgeoning anti-Semitism coming largely from legacy Jewish organizations are entirely accurate. Uh, and I wanna talk a bit about the Canadian context. So in Canada, um, the organization B'nai B'rith, which is a self-proclaimed human rights organization, <clears throat> has published an audit of anti-Semitic incidents since 1982. And it's considered very authoritative and it's quoted, you know, by the press quite frequently. So in, in, in uh, B'nai B'rith's 2021 audit, reported 2,799 anti-Semitic incidents. Interestingly, an almost identical number of incidents was reported in the U.S. by the Anti-Defamation League, um, also a group that's been around for more than 100 years uh, defending Jews against defamation and anti-Semitism. However, there's a little problem here and something that I noticed and wrote about. 
is that there are nearly 17 times more Jews in the U.S. than there are in Canada. Um, Canada has about 400,000 Jews. The U.S. has uh, about six and a half million. Um, so this suggests that anti-Semitism is running absolutely rampant here, despite the fact that the Anti-Defamation League itself ranks Canada as the second least anti-Semitic country in the world. So the difference um, in the methodology, the difference is in the methodology the ADL uses. Uh, ADL does not include incidents involving criticism of or protest against Israel as a priori anti-Semitic, unless there's evidence of anti-Semitic tropes and intent. But a Brith, however, does deem all such events as anti-Semitic. Nearly 90% of the incidents of harassment that B'nai B'rith catalog, um, which constitute the majority of reported anti-Semitic in incidents, took place online with one tweet equaling one anti-Semitic incident. Um, when political activity and expressions of anti-Israel or pro-Palestinian st sentiment are believed to constitute anti-Semitism, the potential for exaggerating the threat of anti-Semitism and for raising anxiety and trepidation among Jews is great. Exaggerating the extent of anti-Semitism sabotages the possibility of building solidarity with other victims of racism, especially when lethal violence is more likely to be a feature of attacks on Black, Indigenous, Muslim, and Arab Canadians, and when violence and hate against those groups is underreported, as we know it is. So you're basically comparing apples and oranges here. Finally, we need to acknowledge uh, that there is a campaign of harassment, intimidation, and violence experienced by those who advocate for Palestinian human rights on our campuses and elsewhere. Last October, Independent Jewish Voices published a 100-page report entitled Unveiling the Chilly Climate, the Suppression of Speech on Palestine in Canada, which I co-authored with Rowan Godet. Uh, and it can be found on the Independent Jewish Voices website. Um, in all, we collected 77 testimonies from 40 faculty members, 23 students, seven activists, and seven representatives of organizations from Ontario, Manitoba, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, Quebec, and Alberta. Um, among the academics responding were representatives from 11 disciplines um, at 21 Canadian universities. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they told us. So these interviewees recounted that their experiences included a whole bunch of unpleasant things. Political intervention into hiring, attempts to prevent access to event venues, and the attempted cancellation of public events on Palestine, as well as targeting and doxing. 128 Canadian academics and activists appear on the website of Canary Mission, an organization which purports to document individuals and organizations that promote hatred of the U.S., Israel, and Jews on North American college campuses. Um, threats of violence and genuine acts of violence were experienced by student activists, and these often contain racial and sexual slurs, including threats of sexual violence. Students were subject to warnings and disciplinary measures by university administrators, whom respondents often described as being hostile to Palestine solidarity on campus. Faculty respondents re reported restrictions on academic freedom, self-censoring of expression on Palestinian human rights, discriminatory treatment by academic publishing platforms, harassment by pro-Israel advocacy groups and media outlets, attacks from colleagues, political interference by university administration, classroom surveillance by pro-Israel student groups, and anti-Palestinian and anti-Arab racism. Racialized individuals have borne the brunt of both the public campaigns of intimidation and the unreported incidents we recorded in the report. Half of the academics we interviewed reported being targeted by campus pro-Israel Jewish student groups and or by external pro-Israel advocacy groups. Ten indicated they had been victims of prolonged smear campaigns initiated by these groups. And I want to emphasize that this is, uh, this is information that we gathered in our interviews. In addition to that, our report actually lists all the public instances of intimidation and harassment um, that have taken place between 2009 and 2021. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting at stuff that has not been public uh, so far. Um, and, and I want to acknowledge there have been complaints by Jewish students of, of anti-Semitic acts and incidents. Um, there, are several, there are a couple of reports that have been written and there was a webinar about the University of Toronto um, a couple of years ago. There have been complaints by by Jewish students of 
uh, of of anti-Semitism. Um, and although some of them have, do have to do with anti-Israel sentiment, and these have got to be taken seriously, and I I think that this is where EDI you know has a job to perform. Um, but on the other hand, there are no organized, funded institutional campaigns against Jewish students and faculty that compare to what we have documented against Palestine solidarity activists. And I want to emphasize that we have the empirical evidence. It exists. It is not hearsay um, and it's not anecdotes. It is full-fledged uh, essays done in the academic style. Um, as a response to the growing internal divide within our Jewish communities over Israel's human rights abuses and to the increasing weaponization of anti-Semitism against those who support Palestinian human rights, progressive approaches to anti-Semitism are beginning to emerge within Jewish communities. An anti-racist approach to anti-Semitism requires Jews to work in solidarity with groups who experience systemic, individual, and state violence, intimidation, and hate, and, and, and as well, we need to be able to see where our experiences are similar, but also where they diverge and sometimes clash. Anti-racist and anti-colonial frameworks for understanding and confronting growing anti-Semitism must challenge the exceptionalizing of Jewish oppression. Believing anti-Semitism anti to be of a different order is a strategy that undermines anti-racist solidarity, and solidarity is what is required if we are to understand and defeat the work that white supremacy continues to accomplish in Western liberal societies. Thanks. Thank you so, so much, Cheryl. There's such clarity when you speak. I just, yeah, thank you very much. And, um, and we'll get back to you, I'm sure, during, during when the questions start to come in. So I'm gonna take the next little while to, um, to talk, to do my part of the talk. I, I'm going to start with a little bit of a biographical sketch and these, you know, telling telling the audience, telling who we are, it doesn't mean that I'm trying to claim an authoritative voice, you know, but it does, I think what it does is give you a sense of who I am, you know, um, because I think w whenever we speak about anti-Semitism, we're always wondering who is this person, where do they come from, you know, how do they see the world, so that's the reason that I wanted to, you know, just tell you a little bit about myself before I begin my more formal um, remarks today. So I grew up, I was born and raised in Windsor, um, Ontario, where many of you are right now. <laughs> um, and I, I lived in the Walkerville area. And Walkerville was not historically welcoming and open to Jewish people, with many of the homes at one time having restrictive covenants against the sale to Jews, Black people, and the Irish. In fact, my great uncle, um, David Kroll, he was the mayor of Windsor in 1939. And at the time, he wanted to buy the Paul Martin House, which is in Walkerville, really not far from where I grew up. But he couldn't um, due to a restrictive uh, covenant restricting sale to Jewish people. So, I mean, the history of anti-Semitism in the area where I grew up and, and much of Canada, of course, is, is quite vitriolic. When I grew up in Walkerville, there were very few Jewish families there. Um, my sister and I were the only Jewish kids that went to my grade school that I know of um, until about grade three or four when one other Jewish family moved into the area. And I grew up with a great deal of anti-Semitism, a lot. <laughs> There was, I, I'm not going to go through, you know, examples, but I will say that there on my block, there was a self-identified um, white supremacist kid that lived on the same street through me. And throughout my childhood, I would say that my sister and I have faced a lot of various kinds of, um, of hatred and, and anti-Semitism. That early childhood experience shaped my interest and dedication to anti-racism. And in many ways, I've only recently started to think through my own experiences of anti-Semitism. I think for many years, because of the immense privileges that I hold and walk with, I it was it didn't really occur to me to vocalize or talk about those earlier experiences and to connect them to anti-racist struggles. But I, recently I was thinking, you know, it's not anti-racism work if you're not thinking through your own experiences of racism, you know. Um, so I have to find a way now to be able to talk about those experiences while also understanding and acknowledging the privileges with which I speak of those experiences, right. Um, I didn't grow up in a home that was religiously Jewish, uh, we, nor was it overtly Zionist. I came, I come from a long line of Jewish communities who fled Russia at the turn of the century, um, both because of um, anti-Semitic violence and pogroms and because of persecution as communists. 
And yet when I turned 18, I did what all of my cousins and my sister and many in my family did. They went to Israel and I, I went to Israel and I lived on a kibbutz and I was there um, for a year in 1994 to 1995 when I learned Hebrew and I generally totally fell in love and I wanted to go back and become a citizen. I can become a citizen because I'm Jewish. Um, it's open to me to make Aliyah, but of course my friends who are Palestinian are not able to. When I returned to Canada, I didn't make Aliyah. I went to Trent University and majored in Indigenous Studies. And I recall that when I learned about settler uh, colonization, I was really in my own head, not out loud, starting to question the narratives that settler colonial states tell themselves about the original inhabitants of the land. And I eventually went on to do graduate work on issues relating to Israel and Palestine, and also at that time uh, began to be active in, in Jewish groups involved in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. So again, I, I'll say it again, I want to recognize um, the amazing position of privilege that I hold when I speak about experiences of anti-Semitism, white privilege, class privilege, cis hetero privilege, a whole host of others. And the anti-Semitism that I experienced didn't create barriers for me in terms of education or employment opportunities. I'm not a target of police, at least not because of my Jewish identity, maybe as an activist sometimes or a criminal defense lawyer, but not in the same way that other racialized communities are. Um, I'm not a target of child welfare services on the basis of my Jewish identity, and I have no idea what it's like to walk through the world with without all of the privileges that I carry and hold, most notably white privilege. I continue to be involved in a number of Jewish groups active in Palestine solidarity, and I've been back to Israel as an activist. I'm working with Israeli Jews and Palestinians and internationals um, to promote you know, peace and justice in, in, in that area. Last September, I started working on a PhD and I'm focusing on the new um, Holocaust denial provision of the criminal code, which is what I'm gonna focus my comments on today. Um, so this is the part of the talk where I'm kind of problematizing um, and thinking through how do we combat anti-Semitism? Um, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. It might not surprise, hopefully it won't surprise any of you that I don't believe in criminalization in order to combat hatred. So I'll tell you a little bit about the, the provision, the new Holocaust denial provision. In June of 2022, Parliament enacted um, Section 319 2.1 of the Criminal Code. And it's under the heading willful promotion of anti-Semitism. So under that heading in the Criminal Code, it's now an offense in Canadian criminal law to communicate statements that will willfully promote anti-Semitism by condoning, denying, or downplaying the Holocaust. This was introduced as part of the 2021 federal budget, which is not the normal course for um, the introduction of, of new proposed new legislation. So section um, 319.2.1 is, is uh, ostensibly a response to the claims in rising anti-Semitism, and it was supported by pro-Israel lobby groups such as B'nai B'rith, the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, and CJA. It's of course inarguable that Holocaust denial is a hallmark of anti-Semitism. False claims about the Holocaust, including, including denial of it altogether, are relied on and promulgated by many groups, and including and perhaps most notoriously white supremacists and neo-Nazi organizations. However, the politically charged climate within which 319 2.1 came into existence, I think, bears further examination. And as do the implications of the criminalization of Holocaust denial in Canada. So I want to take you here. I'm, I'm currently looking at archival research and learning a lot about Jewish history in Canada and Jewish involvement in um, the shaping of the prior existing hate speech provisions of the criminal code. So post-World post War II in Canada saw a rise in white supremacists and neo-Nazi groups and uh, propaganda, basically. So they were really small in numbers, but really large in impact. And many in the Jewish community were obviously and rightfully alarmed and wanting to do something to counter the hateful um, violence that was being directed at Jews. At that time, the Canadian Jewish Congress and B'nai B'rith, um, two communal Jewish organizations, took the lead in advocating for hate speech legislation. And the debates leading to the enactment of uh, the hate speech provisions of the code, which include the offenses of advocating genocide, willful promotion of hate, and public incitement of hate, have been called the most debated piece of legislation. And just as a side note, that quote comes from David Kroll. I just came across it in the archives that he um, referred to it as, 
as that. And he's the great uncle that I was talking about that couldn't um, buy a house in Walkerville. Within the Jewish community, there were heated debates about the call for the criminalization of hate. Um, and I want to contrast that with current debates, because at, when I'm reading these historical debates, they're infused with like robust intellectualism and differences of opinion, and they're heated and they're protracted. They went on for like 15 years. It was eventually the new legislation was enacted in, in 1970. So these de among in the heart of these debates were concerns about freedom of speech, civil liberties, whether criminalization could work to fight anti-Semitism. Many thought that criminal trials might actually work to foster anti-Semitism by providing a public platform for, for neo-Nazi groups to further spread their victrolic and vile messaging. There were questions about um, what criminalization would actually achieve and whether focusing efforts and resources elsewhere, for example, um, education and, and public education might be a better route to combat anti-Semitism. Some of Canada's greatest um, lawyers, Jewish lawyers in particular in this context and legal thinkers were involved in these conversations, including Bor Alaskan, Harry Arthurs, Joe Borovoy, and others um, were at the heart of these discussions. And they spent years trying to carefully think through how best to protect freedom of speech um, while also protecting Jewish people from hate. And I say, you know, I mentioned these names of these, you know, these are the grandfathers of criminal law and, and, and other areas of civil liberties. And there was a, it was a legitimate debate to talk about how to combat anti-Semitism. There were lots of people involved in it. And I'm not sure that dissent is treated the same way today because of um, issues that Abby and Cheryl have both touched upon. Um, it concerns me, really concerns me, that the enactment of Section 319 2.1 included no debates. Um, because the section was introduced as part of the federal budget, this meant that the bill um, introducing the proposed legislation was not properly debated or vetted by relevant stakeholders. And that's language coming from the Canadian Bar Association who wrote a letter, um, you know, outlining their concerns that, and part of their concern with the lack of democratic process involved in the creation of this provision. So here I want to turn our attention to what the implications are of instantiating the Holocaust in terms of broader anti-racist struggles and where anti-Semitism might fit into those struggles. Section 319.2.1 is only directed at speech that relates to the Jewish experience of genocide, um, as, the, as the heading includes the word anti-Semitism. So this means that denial of, or I think it means it hasn't been you know, litigated yet, but I think I read that as meaning that um, queer, Black, Roma people's experience of the Holocaust, for example, would not be covered by the gambit of the offence. I also want to think through what it means to instantiate the Holocaust as the only genocide um, that's recognized by the criminal code. So it's perfectly legal in Canada um, for anyone to deny the history and ongoing legacy of colonization um, or the genocide of Indigenous people. Uh, Stephen Harper denied the fact of colonization a number of years ago, and that perfectly remains legal. It's also perfectly legal to deny the history and ongoing legacy of slavery. Um, Recognition of the Holocaust and the harmful effects of denial by the criminal code seems to position Jewish people and anti-Semitism within a sort of really what I see as a really toxic form of oppression Olympics. And I think in oppression Olympics, the whole point is that nobody wins. <laughs> you know, there's not um, an amelioration of racism when when that's the framing of the of the conversation. As well, what does it mean to call for criminal offenses to be added to the criminal code, as well as calling for further resources to be investing in policing anti-Semitism? Um, what does it mean to call on the police to, to police anti-Semitism? <laughs> Um, as an institution that was born out of colonization, the containment of indigenous people and the slave patrols, can policing be an, an uh, can policing anti-Semitism be an antidote to Holocaust denial? What does it mean to turn to the criminal law at all in the face of resurgent black abolitionist calls to defund the police and divest from the criminal legal system? Um, what does it mean to call for more criminalization in the face of indigenous decolonial movements, which are criticizing the police and the structural violence that settler colonial legal systems bring? I, 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 who will be most likely to be prosecuted for offenses under this section? And what is it that any of us thinks prosecution will achieve? 
Um, as, a, as a criminal defense lawyer, I'm deeply aware of the harms that the criminal legal system produces. And I don't believe that criminalization of racism of any kind is the answer. Um, I do think the answer is interrogating white supremacy and white supremacist structures and doing so in solidarity with the main targets of these structures, Indigenous, Black, um, racialized people. I think that's the answer, as you both have talked about solidarity. A few years after the enactment of the original hate speech provisions of the code, and in reference to Jewish advocacy in many of um, Canada's legislative changes, including changes to racist immigration laws, the enactment of a human rights regime, labor and employment gains, then leader of the Canadian Jewish Congress, Saul Hayes, proclaimed, and then we finally became white. And it's actually this comment that led me to do a PhD. <laughs> because I don't know what it means exactly. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think through, like, what was that the goal? Because it's it's read the way he says it. It's read as, as if that was the, the goal, right? Um, is it that the engagement with law and legal processes to advance modern Western so-called liberal rights regimes um, is a mechanism that produces whiteness? Is it that those things worked and so then Jews didn't face as much discrimination in Canada and then we became white? Like, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot to think through and a lot more work to be done thinking through what it means. Um, but it made me think a lot and has made me think a lot about the legal production of racial Jewish racial identity in Canada as white. This is something that's been written a lot about in the United States, but not so much in Canada. And I, I want to think about how calls for criminalization in um, the context of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial might work to further concretize Jewish racial identity as white. We were not always considered white in Canada, even those of us with light or white skin. And I think we really need to start to think through how white Jews have come to be understood as white in Canada, whether this racial classification is contingent, if so, contingent on what? Um, and we also need to start thinking about how to recognize white privilege without further investing in the formation and solidification of Jewish racial identity as white, because I think that's an investment in white supremacy in many ways. In other words, how do we divest from white supremacy, as Afro-Jewish scholar and philosopher Lewis Gordon implores us to do, um, while simultaneously acknowledging white privilege? Of course, here it bears repeating that not all Jews in Canada are white, and I ask you to keep my earlier comments in mind. Um, so to conclude, I don't think Section 319 2.1 will work to ameliorate anti-Semitism, and I think it has the potential to create divides amongst groups facing racism. We have to find ways of combating white supremacy without turning to a system that causes such grave amounts of harm. And we need to find ways to build and create solidarities in doing so. It's interesting that all three of us wrote about solidarity as the um, as the way to safety in, in many ways. So um, with that, I wonder if there are um, questions from the audience coming in? Yes, we actually have quite a few questions, so we won't have time to get to all of these and pieces for discussion. So, uh, but thank you for uh, such an engaging, um, but like different thoughts and so on on this. And I look forward to some more of the discussions from uh, some of these questions. So I'll start with this first one here, is uh, do you believe that uh, BDS, that's boycott, divestment, and um, uh, sanctions. Um, so sanctions. Thank you. <laughs> um, is a productive group, even though studies support that BDS hurts Palestinian per people and their economy and violates many laws in the U.S. and Canada. Do you believe murdered Israelis uh, due to terrorism should be given the same weight as given to Palestinians murdered in the wars in the Middle East as different from BDS? Okay, so I'm going to... Seems gonna... to be a couple of things that are merged in there, but I'll turn this over to you. Go ahead. I wonder if you wanted, Katie, give us a couple of questions. I think you were going to maybe group them just so we... Okay, at a time, like, can you okay. tell us... A... Sure. More and to the next one. Um, and just so that we get some. Oh, okay. It's a very active question. Uh, I was looking to see if there were other ones who had put in 
some questions in that. Um, so one having to do with is heightened news reporting on Israel, uh, such as March 2021, um, is uh, why when there is heightened news reporting on Israel, as in March 2021, is anti-Semitism at its highest? And asking if you do not believe anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, then uh, what do these patterns suggest? Is anti-Semitism when Jewish, not Israeli, students are targeted for Israeli acts? I think someone had uh, spoken a bit about that. And um, I'll ask another one here. Why do you believe Israel is constantly the target of criticism when Russia, China, and countless other countries are committed, have committed genocide? Do you believe people hate Israel or have an eye on Israel closer due to the pattern in our history of anti-Semitism? Okay. Do you want to go, do you want another one or are you fine with those ones? I think we can start with those um, okay. uh, those questions. I I'm happy to an, try to answer the VDS question. Um, would that be okay? And Abby and Cheryl, if you want to, I'm probably I think these are collective answer questions. So um, maybe I'll start. I think it's a really good question to ask about whether BDS hurts Palestinians and hurts the economy, and you know it has a lot of repercussions. Um, but I think it's really important to keep in mind that the call for BDS came from um, Palestinian civil society, aware, of course, there's an awareness in that call that it may harm the economy, you know, it may hurt Palestinian businesses, it may cause um, some economic um, turmoil in many ways, but, but the, but the, but the call came from within. Right. And so in many ways, taking up that call is a way of expressing solidarity with the people who are um, uh, experiencing uh, the, the forms of oppression that they want to overcome. And so I, I try to abide by the BDS movement. I support the BDS movement. I I mean, but when I say try, I mean, I try to look into where my products are coming from and all of those kinds of things. Sometimes it's not always uh, information's not always readily available. But when I do that, I'm I'm answering a call for solidarity. And I wonder if um, Cheryl and Abby have anything to add to that uh, that part of the question. No. Okay. So the um, the second one is also a really good question. So at times, you know, in March 2021, for those of you, I'm assuming that the the questioner is referring to um, attacks in Gaza and Israeli attacks in Gaza. And um, at times, historically, when there are attacks on Palestinians, anti-Semitism in the diaspora does tend to get heightened. Um, so that was the question. It's a really good. Uh, question and the question was about you know Jewish students being held accountable. Um, I'll say that when Jewish students are held accountable for what happens in Israel on that basis alone, that I think you know that's an example of anti-Semitism. <laughs> but I'm going to ask Cheryl and Abby to sort of weigh in on this. Cheryl, I know you've talked about this issue in the past. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I totally agree. I mean, no group should be held collectively responsible for what the home country does. Um, for sure. Um, in terms of the incidence of anti-Semitism going up, I think uh, when so the, the questioner put it as when Israel is in the news, but I'm going to state it slightly differently because what was happening in the spring of 2021 is that Israel was bombing Gaza. Um, I know there were at least 60 children killed in those bombings. You can't refer to children as terrorists, even though you know, whenever uh, Palestinians are killed in Gaza, the the claim is that the people who were combatants who were killed, um, and that's really hard to know. So it's not that Israel was in the news; it's, it's that Israel was doing things that really disturbed people, um, and uh, having a disproportional response to um, uh, unrest, for example, in the old city of Jerusalem. Of course, this was during Ramadan. Um, which is the holiest month in the Islamic calendar, um, and it, it unleashed quite a bit of, of, of fury, um, in addition to the fury that already exists around the occupation. So I, I, I think that, um, uh, and again, you have to, I think, refer back to what I was talking about in terms of how do you vet 
these incidents um, of anti-Semitism. So I, during that time, the response from the institutional Jewish community to what was going on, for example, in Toronto, where I live, um, so people were saying things like the, there was a there was a, a protest march um, during this time, uh, and there were about five thousand people at this, and people were talking about the protest itself as being anti-Semitic, and they were it was scary, and people were you know pro-Palestinian people were rampaging in the streets. Um, none of this is true. There were even attacks um, on pro-Palestine protesters that were um, interpreted by some very, you know, heavy duty public figures, including Trudeau, um, as, as anti-Semitic, when in fact it was quite the opposite. So everybody was very quick to um, cast what was going on as being anti-Semitic when there was really no evidence of that happening. Um, I think there is, I think when um, people who have strong feelings for Israel um, and are worried about Israel's, you know, safety, um, see uh, certain kinds of slogans. And there's been lots of debate around the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. So a lot of people, you know, who are very pro-Israel would interpret that in a genocidal way, that, that you know, Palestinians want to throw Jewish Israelis into the sea. Um, I think there are other many different interpretations of that slogan, but it must sound very frightening to some ears. Um, I think that um, part of that has to do with long-held beliefs about, um, about the inherent anti-Semitism of Palestinians, for which there is very little evidence, actually. I mean, there are clearly huge, you know, there, Palestinians are just divided on this as Jews are in many ways. But, you know, genocidal impulses do not seem to dominate in any way, shape or form. So I think that it's, it's really, I know that it can sound scary to a lot of people, but we need to step back and, and admit to ourselves what is happening there and that the price that Palestinians are paying, Jews pay a price as well. But in terms of, of loss of life, loss of freedom, um, you know, loss of clean water, loss of water, loss of drugs, loss of, of the basics of life, Palestinians are suffering irreparably. And I think that people um, who support Palestinians in this part of the world, when they see um, violence unleashed, get quite angry. Uh, most of the time, it is not articulated through acts of violence or even, you know, um, acts of harassment. Um, people come out and demonstrate as legally, you know, as we are allowed legally to do. Um, I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of misinformation. I could go on and on about this, but there's a lot of misinformation and misapprehension and interpretation of certain kinds of acts and slogans that don't really, um, you know, uh, jive with, with, with reality. Um, so it's a really, it's a complicated picture. People are, a lot of Jewish people are going to feel very threatened by what they hear said, um, but the interpretation is not always an accurate one. Um, and and uh, I think that that you know it's it's very hard to get. If, if you're like me, you spend like many hours a day uh, updating myself on what's going on um, in Israel Palestine, what's going on in the Jewish community. I think it depending depending on where you get your information from, there's a lot that is unrevealed. Um, and that people don't know. Uh, and I think sometimes if, if the full expanse of, of oppression and suffering were revealed, there would be, you know, more of a tendency to, to understand the, the, the anger uh, on the Palestinian side and understand the frustration. So it does come out in these places. It is documented that there are the rise in incidents uh, and anger when, when Israel um, disproportionately targets Palestinians with violence, um, and it shouldn't surprise us really that that happens. But you know, again, you have to look very and the documentation that happened around the the purported anti-Semitic incidents in Toronto, at the very least, and other parts of Canada, was so slim. Like we did not have the the actual details of most of the events that happened, and they never did get published or 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 put forward. So you know we have to be able to understand what happened, to put it in, to 
proportionally, to understand it in proportion, um, in order to be really clear on what constitutes anti-Semitism and what does not. I Abby, to you. Did you, thank you, thank you, Cheryl. Um, Abby, did you have anything to add to that particular? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just add a, a couple points. One is uh, to the point about BDS, I just wanted to emphasize that the boycott, divestment and sanction strategy originated from 170 Palestinian civil society organizations specifically because they wanted to see a nonviolent strategy that was based on education. And so the it, it, it comes from Palestine and it's a request internationally to say we're setting up a picket line and asking you not to cross. Um, and in in the Jewish faculty network, the uh, network that, that we're a part of, we um, we have some people who support BDS. I'm one of them. We have many who don't. But we universally see that the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement is a nonviolent movement that should be able to function legitimacy legitimately on our campuses without um, harassment and without charges of um, being anti-Semitic. And Jill, I had something to say about the third question. Should I just jump in and say that now or are you going to go back? I just have two things that I wanted to say, um, if that's okay, and then we'll go on to the to the third um, question. One is that uh, there was a question connected to the BDS question about the loss of life and whether there, you know, whose is valued, and the answer is I value all life, including all Israeli Jewish life, all Israeli life, all Palestinian life, and I'm devastated every single time there's any loss of life. But the reality for me, or the way that I see it, is that. Israel actually has the power to stop the violence um, and Palestinians don't have the power to stop Israeli violence against them. <laughs> so it's a it's about a power imbalance that I'm speaking to. It's not that I value certain life over the other. The other thing I wanted to say is that I interpret from the river to the sea as saying that we're not just talking about uh, um, the occupied West Bank or Gaza Strip. We're talking about Palestinian human rights within the entire region. Palestinian is uh, citizens of Israel, um, Bedouin people, meaning from the river to the sea. And I would tell you that if I ever was at a protest and I thought somebody wanted to throw Jewish Israelis into the sea, I would not be able to stand next to them because that's not an anti-racist movement, right? But in my experience, I've been um, an activist in this movement since around 2002, and I've never, I've yet to meet somebody who, um, and I'm not saying they don't exist, I, you know, I, I don't know, but I've never encountered that, and it's not something that I could stand next to somebody if I, if I knew that they were calling for genocide, you know, genocide. So, um, yeah, if you want to, I think the third question, Abby, was about double standards kind of holding to the idea of holding Israel to um, a different standard than, say, China, or not focusing on on other or Russia were the examples listed, and and I wonder if you want to speak to that. And I'm sure, Cheryl, you might have some comments too. And um, we'll see how much time we have left after that for more. Time. Yeah, this is an important question, and um, you know, the the sometimes there's a sense that Israel is being exceptionally targeted, um, and that that other human rights violations are, are are sort of not targeted. So let me say at the outset that um, I think any state that violates any human rights is a legitimate subject of protest um, and and we have to support the right to protest any violation of human rights. But on a global scale, um, the United Nations is an imperfect place saver for the global. It is it, it's it's not ideal, but it's what we've got and international human rights law and um, laws associated with the General Assembly help us to the extent that we can in the world that we live in to govern ourselves according to some type of common standards. And um, the United Nations has repeatedly called Israel to account for um, violation of the right of return for Palestinians that has not been implemented, for the um, occupation after 1967, for using certain types of um, weapons that are considered uh, criminal and violation of international law. And Israel continues to reject the United Nations as a legitimate vehicle 
for measuring Israeli state actions. Now, other states sometimes reject actions too, but it is not the case if you actually look at the United Nations. And with my research partner, Yasmin Abulabin, we've done several years of, of research on the United Nations in, in terms of its relationship to racism. And there have been periodic times when Israel has been a subject of, con of, of continued criticism. That's true. But there have also been far more, there's a longer history of when South Africa was the target of repeated history. And currently, if you look at the activities of what Russia has done in Ukraine, which is tragic and unspeakable, um, there has almost been an international boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign in a very short period of time against against Russian trade. So um, the the issue is that Israel, Israel and the, the, the ruling political parties of Israel, Israel, you know, doesn't have a voice. People have a voice and the political, the politicians of Israel have repeatedly insisted on Israel's exceptionalism on the grounds that because it is a Jewish state, it is not like other states. That is, it, it is a unique state in the Middle East. It is claimed to be the only quote unquote democracy in the Middle East. That of course is now being, I mean, it, it needed to be challenged long before this, but it's even, it's being challenged by Israeli citizens. Um, so the, the, the other question is, what about Palestinians on a global scale who don't have a state, who don't have state representation? And Palestinians, when Palestinians express their insistence that they are human and that they have human rights, the United Nations has in some ways recognized that, but there has been no enforcement. Um, there's been virtually no enforcement to ensure that those rights are recognized. So uh, I don't think it's reasonable to say that Israel is exceptionally targeted. I think that Israel claims to be exempt from international law and no state should be exempt from international law. And when the Palestinians ask for our solidarity, particularly those of us who are Jewish, who if we don't speak up, we're implicated in the state of Israel because it carries the Star of David on its flag and claims that it that it represents our interests. And so we, we have to speak up and we have to say no not in our name. We stand in solidarity against all forms of racism. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Were you about to say something, uh, Julian? We just have oh, oh. Uh, a few minutes well, left, so no. you wanted to say that? No, I just, I didn't know if Cheryl had anything that she wanted to add. No, I think Abby said it, said it all, but, um, but yeah, go ahead, Kate. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're muted. Oh. Cheryl, you're muted. Cheryl, you're muted. Let me add one. No, I heard what. I, oh, Cheryl, go ahead. Let me add just one you're, one comment. I, I I'm in awe of my colleagues here. I think they're brilliant. Um, and that you know the question was, do people hate Israel because of anti-Semitism? Um, and that's an interesting question. And I think um, in some cases, yes. I I think we would be very uh, naive to think that there is no animus directed at is Israel because it's a Jewish state. There are anti-Semites in the world and they will think that way. Um, uh, on the other hand, I don't think that is the major, um, you know, motivating factor. And one of the things we do know from very recent research has just come out last year, um, is that there used to be a theory that there's a horseshoe that represents um, anti-Semitic uh, feelings and, anim and animosity toward Israel, where it's on the far left, right and the far left. What we know is that anti-Semitic sentiment on the far left is a non-starter. That the anti-Semitic, and these are, this is research in doing it done in the States and some of it in Europe, um, that we can no longer make that claim, which also makes you know the the, the equating of anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism something that you know it is very hard to to pursue. Um, so it it you know there there are haters and they're going to hate. Um, and we won't deny that, um, but I don't think that that's what underlies most of the uh, uh, of the criticism of Israel. And, and if I can just add to that, I think the if there like to the extent that there becomes an assumption that criticism of Israel or saying the land to the sea will be free is anti-Semitic is actually a form of anti-Palestinian racism because there's an assumption in there that 
um, all Palestinian people um, aren't legitimately protesting, but that they, the real secret is that they hate Jewish people and are anti-Semitic and are cast as anti-Semitic for uh, speaking up against the conditions of their lives. So I think there's, you know, some of anti-Palestinian racism has um, it permeated some of our conversation just now, you know, and I wanted to just name it as uh, being a real problem for Palestinians. So not only are Palestinian people living under horrible conditions of apartheid, but then um, and when saying so, when um, engaging in nonviolent protests are also cast as anti-Semitic. So I'll, yeah, I'll just leave that, that out there. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I have a, a comment in the uh, in the comments here that uh, says uh, my sincere thanks to all of you. Your words have been powerful and edifying. You've helped me see connections where I did not before. Sorry, I don't have a question, just my many thanks. So I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, it's just an appreciation of this forum to be able to come together and to bring other uh, voices in there as well. Uh, what I see having been in the field for uh, quite a while is that uh, what I see is a hallmark of uh, pretty well most isms is the demand by the center or those in the places of power, a demand that those on the margins uh, be one, be uh, speak from one voice. When you folks decide what you want, then talk to us and that sort of thing like that and demanding that people are all the same and that diversity is only a place of its diversity is only the privilege of those in the privileged place and that and that diversity is not tolerated from those who are in the margins. And so I would see that um, solidarity is coming together and being together. It's not the same as being the same. And so a lot of times then that's what's so important is having these discussions with uh, differing perspectives and keep the conversations going. We're not, and so people don't, not even thinking that all of the people on the panel have the same perspectives on things and so on. If you're, if everybody in a group is all thinking the same and having the perspectives that are the same, it means that we've stopped talking and we need to keep talking and need to be able to connect with those areas of, uh, of diversity and such. But I really appreciate uh, the voice that folks have brought here today. And, um, Again, I want to remind everybody um, that uh, if you want to um, get more information to visit the, uh, the website to find out all of the items that are on uh, for the rest of the week. And uh, the website, yeah, see, I should have just stopped there because I'm going, the website is in here. Oh, there it is. It's uh, uwindsor.ca slash VPEDI to register for uh, those that we highlighted uh, earlier today, uh, earlier this evening. So I want to thank everybody again from coming from the audience and uh, I hope and encourage people to keep the conversations going. So thank you. Thanks everyone and thank you to all, all the who attended and to my fabulous um, co-panelists, Abby and, and Cheryl. Thank you. It's, a, it's been a real honor to speak with all of you today.